Good morning, everybody. We're glad that you're here to worship with us today. My name is Aaron, and this is Faith, and this is our awesome Cornerstone band. So go ahead and stand if you're able. Uh, we're going to get into a time of worship. I hope you guys all had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, we're going to start with some scripture, some prayer, and then we're going to join our voices together in one accord to worship our God. So our psalms today comes from Psalm 41 through 3. I'm going to invite you to go ahead and read that with me right now, people of God. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up out of the pit from destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth and a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Amen. Pray with me. God, we thank you so much for today. Lord, we come here as one people to worship you, to lift your holy name up. And Lord, we pray and ask that you inhabit the praises of your people. God, we love you for, for bringing us here safely, for giving us time with family. So Lord, we just uh, give this time back to you as an offering. So we invite your Holy Spirit into this place. Anoint us, Lord. We love you and we thank you. And it's in your holy and precious name that we pray. Amen.
gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. And to this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, and for my life is wholly bound to His feet. And oh, how strange and divine I can sing what is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me.
Will you pray with me? God, we thank you this morning just for the ability to gather here together as a community. We thank you for the people that we came with and the people who are sitting beside us. We thank you that this is a place where we get to come and sing about how precious you are and the gifts that you have given us. God, we thank you for the cool weather and for all of the things that we can't even see that are all around us that you are doing for us and through us. May we be people who don't take those gifts for granted, but actually extend them with generosity toward the people around us. God, we know that the season we're entering into is one filled with joy and laughter and love and family and friends, but it's also one filled with stress that as we count down closer to Christmas, our to-do lists get longer and we're fielding all kinds of invitations and things to do or strife with family. God, with the joy 
comes the hard stuff too. We ask that you would give us each and every day what we need to just make it through. Would you remind us that in the midst of all of the hardship and the stress and the to-do lists, that you are there, that you're with us, and that you promise never to forsake us, and that this season is not just something to get through, but actually something to enjoy. Would your peace come among all of us here? And in response, Lord, may we be a people who extend that peace to everyone that we meet. And when we're not sure how to do that or even what to pray or how to talk to you, would you remind us of the words that your son taught us that we pray now together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Cornerstone. My name is Alex Johnston. I'm the director of spiritual formation here. And I just want to see what we're working with this morning, okay? So if you've already decorated for Christmas, raise your hand. Okay, that's pretty good. Where are my uh, curmudgeons at, the ones who haven't decorated yet? Yeah, okay, this was the first year I trained my husband well, unprompted. He brought down all of our Christmas decorations before Thanksgiving had even begun. I'm pretty proud of that. I think it's exciting. Thank you, thank you. Um, Okay, who has already done the bulk of their Christmas shopping? Okay, where are my procrastinators at? Y'all are my people. I love it. I love it. Look, we know that there is a ton that you have to do to prepare for Christmas. A lot going on in this season. This morning, all I want to do is tell you about two things that we think that you should add to your list. Not because we think they're things that you have to do or that you should feel obligated to do, but because they're things that we think will help make this season a little more bearable, a little more joy-filled, and help us focus in on the real reason that we celebrate Advent and the Christmas holiday. Here's the first thing. You can pick it up today. This is our Advent devotional for 2023. It's called The Greatest Story Ever Told. And what it does is starting next Sunday, December 3rd, it's going to trace the story of Jesus from the very beginning. Because we think that the story of Jesus didn't begin in a manger. It actually began thousands of years before that in a garden. And so what this does is, for a few weeks, it's going to lead you up through the Hebrew Bible, tracing the footsteps of Jesus through the Old Testament to the birth story, and then even beyond to talk about what it means for us. We really believe that the story of Jesus is the greatest story ever told. And if we want to experience Christmas in a new way this year, we think that this is one way to do it. And fun fact, it's written by three women in this church, myself, Hannah Buchanan, and our colleague, Elizabeth Hamill. So we really think that this is something um, that you should pick up today. You can also pick it up at our Advent Festival. It's also available online. We invite you to our Advent Festival next Sunday in the afternoon. Whether you have kids, grandkids, no kids at all, there is something for you at Advent Festival this year, including a new experience called Stations of the Star. It's an interactive walkthrough of the birth story, again, just designed to help you focus on the reason for the season and give you a moment of peace and pause this Advent season. Okay, here's the second thing. And really, if you are just a visitor to this church or you don't consider this your church home, maybe this is your first time here, you can, like, take a break for a second. You're off the hook. Everybody else, you probably got something in the mail that looked a little bit like this. This is our End Well, Start Strong campaign. There's two pieces to this. End Well is about ending the year well in all the different ways that this church helps to fight poverty in our local community and all around the world. It's about supporting the ministries of this church that give help and hope to those who need it most, including our Belong Disability Ministry. And so we hope that at some point over the next few weeks that you will make a contribution to our End Well campaign to help us do that, to help us fight poverty here in Dallas and around the world. And then, starting now, we're in 
January. We hope that you will be intentional about your giving, making a pledge to give in the new year. And we think that this is important for two reasons. First, because generosity is a spiritual practice. It's something that teaches us how to live with unopened or opened hands, not unopened hands, but open hands to practice generosity. If we're not intentional about it, it's actually a lot harder to do it. And we'll end up with this mentality of hoarding resources and thinking that there's a scarcity mindset. Here's the second reason. When you give, lives are transformed. I say it every time I'm here because we really mean it. We get the benefit of seeing stories and hearing your stories about all the ways God is moving in the life of this church through our programs and ministries and different events. Things like our youth ministry, our children's ministry, our belong, things like our Advent devotional that we're able to give away for free because of the generosity of this church. So if this is your first time here, or if you're a new visitor, you don't call this your church home, you need to know you are surrounded by very generous people. And because of their generosity, lives are transformed here in this community and around the world. There are lots of ways you can give. This mailer that you got has instructions. The easiest way to do it is through the QR code on the seat back in front of you or online at hbmc.org slash give, where you can learn about all the things we've talked about this morning and so many more for you to participate in the end of this year and for the year to come. Okay. I have the habit of rushing to Christmas, as you probably can gather, after Thanksgiving without even pausing to like have a moment of gratitude. In fact, this year it's even worse because a week ago I sent an email to like all the women of this church encouraging them to sit around the table and you know, share what you're grateful for. And guess who forgot to do that with her family? That would be me. So if you haven't done it, it's okay. You're in good company. Here's what we're going to do this morning. Hannah's going to come up in just a moment and share a really powerful message with us. But for right now, we're going to ask you to stand up and greet the people around you. Say hello. Give them a high five or a fist bump and share one thing that you're grateful for in this season. This is such a good sound. (laughs) Jeff, you look like you're relaxed at the Thanksgiving table. That's good. Well, once again, welcome to Cornerstone. My name is Hannah Buchanan. I'm one of the pastors on the Cornerstone team. I am not a naturally grateful person. Like Thoughts of gratitude don't spontaneously bubble up to my head very often. In fact, I spend most of my thought life in one of three buckets. And as I describe these buckets, it would make me feel less alone just to see you nod your head if you dwell in that place too. So the first, kind of the most of my thought life is spent in the category of the what needs to be done thoughts. I'm seeing some head nods. Like I wake up in the morning and think about what needs to be done for whom. And I often go to bed at night lamenting the things that did not get done that were, there's a head nod, mm -hmm, that were probably unrealistic to expect myself to do in the first place, but I live a lot of my life in the what needs to get done category of thinking. I spend a lot of my life in this second bucket. I call it um, the I wish this were different category of thought, or um, I wish he were different, or she were different, or you were different, or this were different, or this system. I spent a lot of time, I call it critical thinking and analysis, but um, mostly it's just critique, complaint, criticism. I spent a lot of time in that second bucket of thought. And then probably up near the top, maybe third, is the, ooh, I want that category of thinking. (laughs) You know, scanning at um, 
It's as simple as like what I want to eat next or that I want a nap or, oh, your top is so cute. Where did you get that? That category of thinking. Gratitude does not rank in the top three of my most natural thoughts. A couple weeks ago, Matt was preaching about um, suffering, and he was preaching out of that passage that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And I looked at the slide, and I thought, gosh, you know, I don't really have any capital S suffering in my life right now. I have lived through seasons of capital S suffering, and I have spoken pretty openly about them from this platform. But most of the suffering in my life, I would call like micro-suffering, like, like the mundane stress of ordinary life just keeping it going. And it's all of those mundane tasks that keep me from the regular practice of gratitude. And we know, you don't need a sermon to tell you this, but I'm going to give you one anyway. Um, we know that gratitude overall has a positive impact on our lives, on our mental health. It's part of our cognitive hygiene. In the same way that working out, drinking more water, sleeping well, improves our overall, overall well-being. So then why don't we do it? Like if we know it, if it's proven to help, why don't we do it more often? Here's what I want to do with our time together. The first thing I want to do is share with you an incredible story of one woman's gratitude under impossible circumstances. It's a story that's been inspiring to me through multiple seasons of my life, and I can't wait to share it with you. The second is to spend time illuminating a very short passage of scripture to invite you to consider what it's speaking to you. And the third is to introduce you to a friend of mine who is an expert, not just in the study of gratitude, but the practice of gratitude. So that's where we're going this morning. Let's settle in and pray. Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? Would you speak through these stories, bring them to life, so that we might be challenged and inspired and comforted, so that we might be um, transformed to grow, be made more whole and more like you. Amen. Corrie ten Boom is a Dutch woman who survived the atrocities of the Holocaust. She wrote about her experience in her memoir called The Hiding Place. Has anyone read The Hiding Place? I don't read books more than once, with the exception of the Bible. I'm on my fourth reading of this book, and here's why. This book is one of the, her story is one of those stories that reminds me, no matter how hard, how dark, or how uncertain our life might look, God is still with us, and God is still active. So if you need that reminder, Amazon Prime this baby during Black Friday month and read it before Christmas. It's a month now. Did you know that? <laughs> Relieve some of the anxiety I felt on Friday. Corey and her family were watchmakers in the Netherlands. And when the Germans came and occupied they began to face persecution, their business was threatened, they were practicing Christians. But without doing it on purpose, they got roped into the Dutch resistance and the underground movement. And before long, her home and her family was a nucleus in the resistance against the Nazis. So they would hide Jewish families. They built a network of people around the Netherlands to help transport Jewish men and women and children to safety outside the Nazi occupation. And they became arrested. They were found out. They were arrested. Her father died in a prison camp. And through a series of stories I won't tell you in this moment, horrible things happened. And Corey and her sister, her sister's name is Betsy, and she's really painted as kind of the saintly one. You read it and you think like, wow, that is next level. I don't know that I'll ever be there spiritually. But Corey and her sister, Betsy, are arrested, stripped, beaten, and transported to Ravensbrück, which was the largest women's concentration camp in Germany. And we'll pick up their story. I'm going to read you an excerpt from the moment they're taken into their barracks, which is overcrowded, dark, and filthy with hundreds of women. So I will read this to you. Settle in. If you like to close your eyes to get a better sense of what's happening, you can go ahead and do that. But listen to this story. Suddenly I sat up, striking my head on the cross slats above. Something had pinched my leg. 
Please, I cried. Betsy, the place is swarming with them. We scrambled across the intervening platforms, heads low to avoid another bump, dropped down to the aisle and edged our way to a patch of light. Here, and here another one, I wailed. Betsy, how can we live in such a place? Show us, show us how. It was said so matter-of-factly, it took me a second to realize she was praying. More and more, the distinction between prayer and the rest of life seemed to be vanishing for Betsy. Corey, she said excitedly, he's given us the answer. Before we asked, as he always does, in the Bible this morning, where was it? Read that passage again. I glanced down the long, dim aisle to make sure no guard was in sight, then drew the Bible from its pouch. It was in 1 Thessalonians, I said. We were on our third complete reading of the New Testament since leaving Schwenningen. In the feeble light, I turned the pages. Here it is. Comfort the frightened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. It seemed written expressly to Ravensbrook. Go on, said Betsy. That wasn't all. Oh, yes, to one another and to all. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. That's it, Corey. That's his answer. Give thanks in all circumstances. That's what we can do. We can start right now to thank God for every single thing about this new barracks. I stared at her, then around me at the dark, foul-aired room. Such as, I said, such as being assigned here together. I bit my lip. Oh, yes, Lord Jesus. Such as what you're holding in your hands. I looked down at the Bible. Yes. Thank you, Lord, that there was no inspection when we entered here. Thank you for all the women here in this room who will meet you in these pages. Yes, said Betsy. Thank you for the very crowding here. Since we're packed so close, that many more will hear. She looked at me expectantly. Corey, she prodded. Oh, all right. Thank you for the jammed, crammed, stuffed, packed, suffocating crowds. Thank you, Betsy went on serenely, for the fleas and for... The fleas? This was too much. Betsy, there's no way even God can make me grateful for a flea. Give thanks in all circumstances, she quoted. It doesn't say in pleasant circumstances. Fleas are part of this place where God has put us. And so we stood between piers of bunks and gave thanks for fleas. But this time I was sure Betsy was wrong. Over the course of their evenings together in that crowded barracks, the women would gather together, huddled around this smuggled New Testament under a bare hanging light bulb. And they would read through the scripture. The scripture was in Dutch, so the Dutch women would translate to German, who would then translate it around the room into French and Polish and Russian and Czech. Corey even goes so far as to describe this part as a little taste of heaven. That in this nightly reading together, she had a glimpse of what it would be like for people of all tribes and nations and tongue to be gathered around the light and the hope and the truth of Jesus. In circumstances so unimaginable, they are clinging to this exhortation to give thanks in all circumstances. I'm just not sure I could have done the same thing. The passage they had read that morning was from 1 Thessalonians, which is a letter Paul writes to a fledgling community of Jesus followers. If you read through Acts with us, you might remember that in Acts 17, Luke tells us about how Paul and Silas went to Thessalonica, to this town, where they were, um, I love the way they describe it, they weren't just witnessing on street corners. What they were doing is they were going into the synagogue to reason and explain and engage people's intellect around why it is reasonable to believe in the unreasonable story of a crucified and risen king. 
And people were believing and the movement was catching on so much so that the religious and political elite were threatened and began to incite a mob. And the charges, they level at them. It's right in Acts 17. It says, these men have turned the world upside down. That the preaching of Paul and Silas about the love and the goodness of King Jesus was a threat to Caesar. They were turning the world upside down and they had to be squashed. So persecution breaks out. Stoning, beating, killing, and Paul and Silas are ushered out under cover of night to get to safety. But the people they leave behind, who they love, continue to endure suffering and pain. So Paul sends his apprentice, Timothy, and says, just go check on them, nurture them, see if you can meet their needs. And Timothy brings back the report that not only are they suffering, but they are flourishing in the midst of their suffering. So when Paul writes this letter, when he says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, he's not being Pollyanna. He is speaking to people he loves who are in pain, who are worried about their safety and their lives. I've heard this before, but um, I love saying that when we read Paul's letters, we're reading somebody else's mail. So he's writing to a particular people. It's important to understand to whom he is writing and why. But he's also writing for us. We're the eavesdroppers. We get to listen to what he's saying. So I want to read this excerpt from his letter to you and to me right where we are. If he's writing for you, what is it speaking to you? So take a moment to consider, what are my circumstances? You know, just as Corey and Betsy were in Ravensbrook, where where are you in your life? And hear this passage of scripture as though he is speaking to you. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you're doing. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What do you hear in there? What does it speak? Where is the nudge? Is it about giving thanks in all circumstances? Being patient with everyone? Helping the weak. How does this speak to you? I love the way she reflected that even in the darkness, and I would say especially in the darkness of that concentration camp, she read those words directly to her circumstances. And they responded by doing it, by practicing it. For some of us, it's so easy to make that list of what we're thankful for. Life is pretty good. We just need to carve out space and protect it. But I know the stories of some of you in this room. I don't know all of them, but I know a fraction of what you've been walking through. Think about just the last year alone, there are people in this room whose marriages have ended, who have lost children, who are facing diagnoses that bring you to your knees in fear. And I'm not telling you to give thanks in all circumstances, like um, this is what you should do, it'll help you. But this is the lifeboat Paul offers to help you stay afloat in the raging waters and the storm. Summer at Ravensbrook turned to fall and to winter. And one day, Corey returns back to the barracks. Betsy's been assigned to a knitting circle. She stays indoors because she has tuberculosis, a very terrible cough. And when Corey walks in, she sees Betsy is smiling. You're looking extraordinarily pleased with yourself, I told her. You know we've never understood why we have so much freedom in the big room, she said. Well, I found out. That afternoon, she said, there had been confusion in her knitting group about sock sizes, and they'd asked the supervisor to come and settle it. But she wouldn't. She wouldn't step through the door, and neither would the guards. And do you know why? Betsy couldn't keep the triumph from her voice. Because of the fleas. 
That's what she said. That place is crawling with fleas. My mind rushed back to our first hour in this place. I remembered Betsy's bowed head, remembered her thanks to God for creatures I could see no use for. What are the fleas in your circumstances? And what would it take to practice giving thanks to God? Not for all circumstances, but in all circumstances. I don't think what Paul is saying is give, give thanks for everything because he knows like Jesus knew and we know that evil and darkness are real. But that God is brighter than the deepest darkness and that he is with us in the storm. And to give thanks in all circumstances, even for the fleas, is an invitation to trust that as dark as the night is, God is with us. And that God is powerful enough to use the pain and the suffering and those icky, awful fleas to bring about some redemption and some good. That we worship and we believe in a God who allows mysteriously evil and dark things to happen but doesn't stand far off within them. That he is creative and powerful and strong and loving and good to use those hard things festering in the darkness to bless us, to protect us, to preserve us in ways we might never be able to see. Can you thank him for the fleas? Matt and I often say we don't want to be pastors who practice what we preach. We want to preach what we actually practice. I've already told you this morning I'm not an expert in this. I'm not standing up here saying do as I do because I'm pretty lousy at this. But I know someone who is really darn good at this and she has challenged me in my own life. And I'm so excited to share her with you this morning. In a moment, I'm gonna invite her up to spend the rest of our time in conversation. Her name is Michelle Geelan. Michelle is a positive psychologist and researcher whose work has been featured on the Today Show several times. She's written a book called Broadcasting Happiness about shifting our perspective in the news from the horrible, awful things to what happens when we're hearing about the good, especially through this practice of gratitude. Michelle and her husband, Sean, not only research this and speak about it, but they practice it. So when she comes up here, she's standing up here with integrity and congruence to teach us more about how we do this in our own lives. Will you help me welcome Michelle up to Cornerstone stage? All right. We'll sit in just a second, but we can just fist bump for now. Yeah. Hi. Um, Michelle, tell us, is gratitude a feeling or a discipline? It is both. Thanks, um, Jay. Thank you so much. Um, it is both. It is a feeling in that um, it's, and that's a blessing when we experience mm -hmm. it, right? To mm -hmm. be thankful for someone or something going like on in our lives. Like this bubbling up of, oh, I'm so thankful because things are so good. Yes. Mm -hmm. It is also, and more importantly, I believe, a discipline. It's mm -hmm. a practice. The reason is that our brains are incredible at scanning the world for threats. Mm. And that, that makes gratitude basically difficult. Mm. It can make it very hard for us. Uh, the amygdala, our threat center in our brain, will scan the world to keep us safe, right? So we know what's going on, we know it might be a threat in our environment, and we know how to deal with it. Mm. And that takes up brain resources and it doesn't leave us with so much to scan the world for the meaning embedded in the work that we're doing, the things that we're grateful mm. for, and all the other good stuff that actually fuels us as human beings. So you're saying I'm quite normal for my three buckets of thought, that gratitude is not in the top three. It's just not natural to our brains. Yes. I mean, some of us are born with a predisposition more towards it okay. than others, but it's, um, it's a learned behavior as okay. well. Uh, there's a fantastic study I love that um, on grumpy older pessimists, these gentlemen had been practicing pessimism for seven and eight decades of their lives. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, researchers- There's none of those out here, are there? No, no, okay. <laughs> researchers recruited them, they tested them for their levels of optimism. So basically mm. how they see the world. We define optimism as the expectation of good things to happen mm. and the belief that our behavior matters, especially in the face of challenges. Mm. And so, um, so they engaged these gentlemen in the practice of gratitude where they'd write three new and unique things they were grateful for each day mm. for a period of time. They were testing as moderate level pessimists to start. After 21 days of keeping this practice up, they began testing on average as low level optimists. 
And then if they kept the practice up for six months, they began testing as moderate level optimists. Same men, nothing about their circumstances besides their habit. Isn't that of incredible? Gratitude. After seven decades, they wow. changed something so central to how we perceive the world. And gratitude also, when we express it to other people, is good for them as well. It changes them. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband, Sean Acor, did a, mm -hmm. a study with LinkedIn and looking at the influence of praise on a, a group of people. Mm -hmm. And what he found was that those people that had received three points of praise over a period of time, they doubled the amount of praise that they put back out into the system. Wow. So if they were recognized for good things they were doing. They were more likely to see the good in others mm. and put it back out there as well. It's that domino effect. Incredible. How do you practice gratitude? Um, so we try to make it fun because, my goodness, it's gratitude, right? We don't want to make it too hard. Um, at the beginning of, uh, <laughs> of the Thanksgiving break with our kids home from school for the whole week, mm -hmm. Sean and I made a whole list of things we wanted to do, some goals, and one of them was to fill a gratitude jar. Now, the jar is only this big, so it's not really huge, right? Yeah. But it's still a sizable goal, and we got to Friday, and it was empty, <laughs> so, which is not a good sign. So, um, so Friday night, Sean made a, a very quick album of photos from mm. the start of school to now. Um, just picked out his favorite photos, put it up on the TV in the living room, and we gave the kids, we have two children, five and nine, little cards and some markers. And we watched this just simple, happy things. This, the, mm. the you know first day of school, and we went on a fall trip. And, and then we all wrote down our gratitudes. I was so proud of our son, the nine-year-old. Mm -hmm. He wrote um, this long list, this little card. with. He wrote five or six. And he's like, I need another card. I need <laughs> another card. I need another. And our daughter, who's just learning to write now, yeah. is just beautifully put these words on paper. Mm. Um, anyway. 40 minutes later, the whole jar was full. It was awesome. Wow. Yeah. How do you think your evening and maybe even the day after were different as a result? It changed it for sure mm -hmm. because then you're focused on all the good stuff, mm -hmm. um, which is why actually, so the other practice that I love is this idea of best moments. We all have incredible, simple things happening every single day. Mm -hmm. um, this idea of best moments was born out of the pandemic. It, um, if you experienced the pandemic like I did, I had two little kids running around and uh, trying to keep work going and also showering, you know, all those <laughs> basic things. And um, anyway, there was, it was pretty much every night that I, my head would hit the pillow. I was exhausted and I don't think I was recording any of that good stuff that mm. was happening because there's so much to do. Mm. So I decided January 2022 to start this practice of best moments, which is a text message each night to Sean. Mm. And it's just small, simple, good things that happen. Zoe gave me a hug and she made me feel so loved. Mm. Leo and I went on a walk and we talked about some fun things, you know, probably video games. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, just three to five things. It, takes, it took me a little bit longer in the beginning. Now it takes me 45 seconds. I've kept up the practice every night for a year and almost two years. Wow. So I have more than 500 notes. What I love about it more than anything, well, of course it changes how I see my day, right? This day was actually full of great mm. stuff. Um, it's allowed me to understand what I, brings me joy. So it, as I see the next day and I see those moments starting to happen, I'm paying more attention. Mm. But I think the greatest treasure is that now I have 500 notes that are basically triggers of memories of things mm. that occurred in my life. So how, how many times have you gone on a wonderful vacation and you come back and you tell a couple friends afterwards and then very quickly we get back to work and back to school and we forget about all the joy we experienced, yeah. right? So this is, an, in essence, a way for me to relive that joy and multiply mm. it. What I hear you saying is you're actually... Um, crafting the narrative of your life. Because when I replay stories, the stories I replay are usually um, conflicts where I am calculating my next move or replaying hard moments or processing difficult things. And you're not saying don't do that, but you are saying when you add replaying these positive things and these memories, you're writing a more accurate perception of reality. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. You're rebalancing it. And, and listen, I, I absolutely believe we need to have that time. Mm -hmm. I have that time, too. It's yeah. a shame when it hits at 2 in the morning and you're processing <laughs> this challenge. And, um, at the same time, because our brain's so good at seeing the negative stuff, mm -hmm. 
we need to rebalance that picture. Um, and it has served me so well in some of the most challenging times of my life. Uh, Tell us about that. 2018, Super Bowl Sunday, halftime. I'm seven months pregnant. When we had our um, three and a half year old at that time, so I was like, this is the second time around. I got this, I feel good, except that night, I didn't feel so good. And uh, I felt so not good that I thought maybe I should go to the hospital. So um, I Ubered there, <laughs> which it's still a running joke. Sean is like, it was a good game, right? Husband you, of the year. Yeah. yeah, it was a good game. It was near bedtime for us. Like, yeah. He, he got me an XL, so that's good. But <laughs> anyway, um, I get to the hospital and they discover my water had actually broke and I was supposed to stay, mm -hmm. so I did. I was 30 weeks pregnant. The idea was to get the baby to 34 without delivering. We made it to 31. And so we give birth to this three pound, mm -hmm. seven ounce little nugget. And she promptly goes to the NICU. And so, and then, so, so did I. Mm -hmm. So I'm every day by her bedside. And I, I saw, I think it's because I, I've, we've spent so much time researching the benefit of gratitude mm -hmm. that I saw in that moment there, I had a bedfellow. It was a, an anxiety-ridden version mm. of myself, right? Mm. And and to kind of push her back and not let her take up so much space, mm. I practiced gratitude every single day as mm. I sat by Zoe's ice, ice away. Um, and I would write about the nurses and the love that they gave mm. and the small incremental improvements mm -hmm. as I watched Zoe's care. And I just really tried to get my brain to focus on all those life-giving mm -hmm. pieces of it. And, um, and I saw how that, that helped calm my spirit. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and when I pray, the, the first, I don't know, 70% of each prayer is gratitude. It's mm -hmm. thank you for all that you've given. Mm -hmm. And then here's some things that I'm asking <laughs> for. <laughs> While you're at it, could yeah. you? So, yeah. and, so, and when I look back at my life, if I could have, you know, they always say, oh, what would you tell your younger mm -hmm. self? You know what I would tell my 25-year-old self as she was sitting in that, in her shoebox apartment with an objectively great life but feeling so depressed? Mm -hmm. I would tell her, start a practice of gratitude. Mm -hmm. Write those good things down. Just help your brain reaccess that because mm -hmm. then it, the, all the other the suffering doesn't feel as heavy. It doesn't mm -hmm. feel as bad. And it and it can help you kind of move your way mm. out of there. Because you're not in control mm. of all your circumstances, but by practicing this, you're actually reshaping the way you are experiencing your circumstances, which then becomes your reality. Yeah, absolutely. And when we talk about the big S suffering mm -hmm. and also some of those little S's that mm -hmm. can take us down, mm -hmm. uh, there's a burgeoning field right now of positive psychiatry, positive psychology, mm -hmm. which looks at treating diseases and disorders that we, you know, to help people come back mm. um, with those traditional therapies, but doing it also alongside some of these positive interventions that we're talking about, your gratitude practice, yeah. sending those nice notes to people, um, you know, getting, getting people to focus on the good things. Mm. I love when <coughs> secular research validates something that is self-evident in scripture, you know, mm -hmm. over and over in the Psalms and through Paul and in Jesus, we're exhorted, like, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. And so to see someone, researchers all over, who have no vested interest in proving the Bible to be true, when we see this synchronicity, um, here's my question. Um, you know, Paul writes, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God. What does this tell you about God's heart, that that's what he wants for us? I think that if we believe that God created all of this, yeah. the beauty and the splendor, mm -hmm. and we... Um, have this opportunity at every moment to be in touch with that, to see it, to perceive it, to say it, to talk about mm -hmm. it, to celebrate it. And we don't. What a shame, right? We're so blessed in every moment. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of whether we can get our, our hearts and our minds to be in touch with that. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and I should say, because <laughs> we were talking about this, about how you and Ryan were yeah, yeah, to your yeah. gratitudes. Um, the other day and how it changed her. Uh, this is a, a very important research study which you should all know about. There was a study done on couples that if you exchange your gratitudes with one another, three new and unique things you're grateful for each night as you're going to bed out loud, 
uh, that researchers found you'll rate each other significantly more attractive at the end of the six months than you did when you started. <laughs> so Merry Christmas. Uh -huh, there you go. Uh -huh. <laughs> So here's how we want to end our time together. We don't want this just to stay an idea or like something that you should do that would be nice to do. We want to give you a little bit of practice space right here. You know, Alex asked you earlier to ask someone what you're thankful for. But take this moment before Aaron and Faith come and close us out with a song and write down on paper, on your cornerstone at a glance, or on your phone, in your notes. What are those things you're thankful for? Maybe even, like, what are some of those fleas? Ways in the midst of your difficulty, you're seeing God show up with goodness and love and kindness to you. So I'm going to pray. We'll leave some of that space for you, and then Aaron and Faith will close us with a song. So pray with me. God, thank you that your teaching is um, true, that it works, that you don't give us this advice or these commands to be burdensome but to lead us into wholeness, to a full and satisfying experience of you in the midst of our ordinary lives. Lord, I pray for each person in this room, whether they are walking through darkness or their list of what they're thankful for is natural and free-flowing. Would you illuminate to us all the ways that you've shown up as we give thanks to you? Amen. I'm going to sing this a couple times, so we'll sing it by myself first, and then I'll invite y'all to stand and join with me. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus. Christ, his son, and now let the weak say, I am strong, let the poor say, I am rich, because of what the Lord has done. of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks. I'd like someone to talk with you after the service is over. If you want to pray with one of us, our team is here. We would love to pray with you, to know your name. Come meet us down at the end of the service. Now will you receive this benediction? We know that the light of Christ shines the brightest in the darkest of circumstances. So may God bless us with the eyes to see the light of God's goodness all around us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace.